the contract. So about twice a year, we cover the entire contract. This is a pick the contract apart, deal with the minutia, the fine print, the stuff that agents hate, don't want to think about, but get in trouble because they didn't think about it. Um, those of you that have been to my classes, I tend to not be politically correct. I tend to say how I think it. Um, I think I have a couple philosophies that this class is based on. One is you have a fiduciary duty to do perfect paperwork. Not okay paperwork, not good paperwork, perfect paperwork. And how you and, and then I also believe that problem solving in real estate is a skill for losers. Because it means you let a problem happen. Your job is to practice potentially paranoid, prepared, preemptive, proactive problem prevention. How do you do that? Perfect paperwork. Um, I've asked, you know, I've been teaching for, for decades, and uh, I used to ask in large classes of contract writing class for the experienced agents in there to simply tell me if they've ever read a contract in one city. 50% of agents say they've never read a contract in one city. You, are, you have no business writing your first contract unless you've read it 50 times. You have it almost memorized where you can answer what question, a section of question that the answer to my question is in, and any recent case law you're familiar with. That's a minimum standard. I ask that in my classes. According to my classes, not my opinion, 2% of agents are actually qualified to write a contract. Article 26 of the state constitution is a very, very big deal. Your license to practice law in the finite area of creating legal documents pertaining to real estate which means you should know your stuff as well as a lawyer knows theirs. Uh, we are not salespeople. Marketing is bullshit. Marketing is what you do to get the opportunity to do your job, and your job is a licensed legal representative, a fiduciary, a position of absolute trust dealing with other people's money. You need to take that extremely seriously. Most people don't. Most people actually think that their business is based on marketing. Marketing is what gets you the chance to do your job. Your job is essentially to practice law and be a legal protector and deal with a contract that I see as a massive legal minefield. This is the biggest, most important, high liability, high dollar signature most people ever sign in their life. Um, and they're signing it typically, in many cases, the majority of cases with an agent who really has no idea what the contract says. This class is about overcoming that. Having said that, please, once a week, until you have the thing memorized, read the contract. If you never read one sitting, read it. It will make you hate it. I hate this contract. It's a big, complicated legal mumbo jumbo, but it has lots of potential problems in it since I'm a problem solver. The crazy, worse the contract gets, the more job security I have because <laughs> I'm that guy. All right, so we're, we're on section three. Um, title and escrow, we'll start with that. First of all, you see you get 117, 118, 119. They actually have blanks. Here's my suggestion and, and my plea. Please fill in the blanks. My favorite one is escrow title company, lawyer's title, nothing else. First of all, I think lawyer's title has about 17,000 offices in town. Which branch? Oh, they have a bunch of escrow officers. Which escrow officer? If my client wants to call someone to say, where do I wire my earnest money? How about we have a phone number and an email address and God help you do not put to be determined or per seller unless your buyer absolutely says to you in writing, I don't care what title company we use. And I guarantee you your, that seller is going to pick a title company in town that I hate. There's two title companies in town I will not use. Make sure you know who you're dealing with. If you get an argument over a title company, here's what I do. I say, good, you like yours? You know, I broke this one on here. You get your escrow officers, because title companies, like real estate companies, not terribly relevant. Real estate companies don't sell houses. Real estate, it's agents that do, so it's about the agent. Escrow companies don't close escrows, the escrow officer does. So I'll say, good, give me your escrow officer's resume, I'll give you mine, and we'll compare it to mine. And you know, because I really don't care who they are, how many deals they've done with them. I want to know their credentials and what they've done. I prefer to work with an escrow officer who's been in the business at least 15 years. Uh, there's a lot of them. Take that seriously. It's not who gives you the coolest, you know, sticker for your car or whatever. It's who actually gets the job done. But put in all the information, the address, all that stuff, except for facts. You don't have to put a fax in because 
I can honestly say I have a set of facts, sent a fax in, it's got to be pushing six years now. I tell people, all my people, faxes are like so last millennium. You know, that's old school stuff. Can you share who you don't mind? What? Can you share who you don't mind? Off camera. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I shall I'll let you guess. And one of my guarantee, typically everyone's got the one on the list. Um, and I don't like them because they literally make no apology that they make earnest money decisions based on the relationship with the agent, not the structure of the contract. And they, they laugh at us. They say, we have sole discretion. I'm like, so yeah, yeah, I don't like it. All right, title investing. Buyer will take title as determined before close of escrow. If buyer is married and intends to take title as his sole or separate property. A disclaimer deed may be required. Taking title may have significant legal estate, planning, tax consequences, etc. They should obtain <coughs> legal and tax advice. First of all, we're licensed to practice law creating legal documents. We're not licensed to practice law, nor is it within our scope, or are we legally allowed to advise someone on how to take title. Now, taking title, in most cases, if it's an individual, sold and separate. If it's a married couple, community property rights and survivorship. If it's a non-married couple, joint tenants rights and survivorship, or tenants in common. We know those things. We do not advise. This little bit about the disclaimer deed is huge. If you have a situation, and uh, it's most, most commonly a divorce, where <laughs> they need their soon-to-be ex or ex-spouse to sign off on something, whether it be on the, on the listing side or the buyer side, um, make sure that you write a clause in that disclaimer deed uh, contingent upon ex-spouse, required party, whatever you want to call them, sign disclaimer deed during the inspection period. That way a buyer has an out. If you put contingent upon signing this, getting that, you make it a contingency, it runs till closing, you've got to find a really stupid listing agent to let their seller sign that, because that literally gives the buyer a back door, and that's, that's actually kind of unfair to a seller. But here's what happens. Have you ever known anyone that went through a divorce? I've known lots of people that have been through divorce. I may have been through some myself. And let me tell you about divorces. You'll hear the term, it's an amicable, happy divorce. It may be a happy divorce on Monday. You get a call from the lawyers that found money in a 401k that they had forgotten about and they want it. All of a sudden, it's not so happy anymore. Twice in the last year, we've had situations where a disclaimer deed wasn't gotten and the buyer forfeited earnest money. One, and another situation, the third one, they didn't forfeit earnest money. Basically, the ex-wife um, comes back and says, I didn't realize you were making so much money off the house. I'll sign the disclaimer deed. This is the day of closing. I'll sign the disclaimer deed, but I want another, I think it was like 10 grand. And literally squeezed the hubby for 10 grand. And she got it, because he needed to close, he needed money, he had another house closing, and she just got it. Yeah. So a disclaimer deed is before the contract or before they buy and quit claim is after? No. Disclaimer deed is, in lack of better terms, a form of quit claim deed. A quit claim deed is I'm quitting my claim to the rights. A disclaimer deed is I'm disclaiming my rights. So but before and after, right? No. It's, it's, there are two words for this, essentially the same thing. Okay. You know, I, I, could, I could, yeah, I don't, there's not a lot of difference. The disclaimer deed is more specific for someone specifically taking themselves off of rights. A quit claim deed can be used to add or take you away. So that's really the difference. Disclaimer deed is literally, I'm waiving any rights under my ownership. I'm disclaiming my ownership. But it needs to be done during the inspection period because, like I said, the other one, they were getting along great. And evidently the feces hit the fan and the divorce and they hated each other. And the ex-husband literally just refused to sign. She couldn't close and she lost her earnest money. Now, the third situation, I gotta be honest, one of the funniest things. It's horrible, but you gotta laugh. Because you're gonna wonder in your head, how the hell does this happen? Uh, we had a client, our client, a uh, uh, lady, um, and she went to <coughs> going to close, getting her closing disclosure, and she got out of underwriting with an underwriting condition that she had a disclaimer deed signed by her 
husband or ex-husband or her husband. And she goes, oh crap, ready for this? Literally, this is close to a quote. I forgot I was married. Been apart for decades, lost touch many years ago. She know if he was alive or dead, no idea where the hell to find him. Literally, the lender will not loan without that disclaimer. They can't, because you can't encumber someone to a loan, which he would be encumbered along. And she couldn't find the guy, and she forfeited her earnest money and didn't get her house. And now, but anyone in this room married? Okay. Once you've been married, you never forget it. <laughs> I've been divorced twice, trust me. I'm familiar with both men. How does that even happen? 20 some years she hadn't heard from the guy. So she just kind of went on with her life. She forgot, you know, that she forgot that that marriage license is a birth certificate. That marriage needed a death certificate, and that's called a divorce. Like I said, you gotta laugh. That's horrible but funny stuff. So anyway, my advice is make it happen during the inspection period to protect your client. And if you're representing a buyer, go ahead and write contingent upon receipt of disclaimer deed. If they're stupid enough to accept that, that means the buyer would literally have until closing to come up with that deed. And if the other person refuses to sign, they exercise their contingency of not signing, they get their earnest money back. And the good news is, there's a lot of listing agents out there dumb enough to let their seller sign that. I love the things I put in and put in contracts and counters that is a complete hope shot that they're dumb enough to let their client do it and they let their client do it. Typically by that I mean client has some heavy rights and they waive their rights by agreeing to take them back. I don't get it. All right. Title commitment and title commitment title insurance. Okay. First of all, title insurance is a little bit misunderstood. There's a concept you learned about the covenants of a deed in real estate, and one of the covenants is quiet enjoyment. Quiet enjoyment has nothing to do with getting rid of the loud neighbor barking dog. Quiet enjoyment is a legal concept. It's a covenant when you receive a, a warranty deed that the, the seller is promising that you can enjoy the ownership and title and deed of that property quietly without any disruption. Obviously, sellers can't really do that. So they purchase title insurance. Title insurance is quiet enjoyment insurance. It protects you against any attack on your ownership and the deed. Title insurance is a great money-making business because title insurance pays out less than 2% in claims, which means if you look at how much you pay in title fees, it's a really lucrative business. But that's what they're there for. Um, buyers need to understand that there are limitations they need to study, and you need to study. We're going to talk about things you need to look at right here. Escrow company is instructed uh, to obtain, deliver, buyer, and seller directly, address pursuant, <coughs> address pursuant to 8S and 9C, or otherwise a commitment for title insurance together with complete legible copies of all documents that will remain exceptions to buyer's title policy, including but not limited to CCNRs, deed restrictions, easements, etc. The exceptions and the deed restrictions and CCNR is the big one. Um, you need to make sure you review title reports. If if it's an HOA, that's that's a that's a next step. That's HOA docs and CCNRs. Uh, but deed restrictions and the other one is is easements. Those show up on there. You'd be surprised how many nice little residential houses in this neighborhood actually have an easement. Oh wait, virtually all of them. What does virtually every house have an easement for? Access guys. Water, gas, electric, and our friends in the cable business. Yeah. Um, so I've had people say, "Why well, don't you know? I don't want that stuff underground." Guess what? You don't want that stuff underground. You better move to the middle of freaking nowhere. But they come with a property. People need to know what they're getting. CCNRs, HOA docs. Now, title company is nice enough to typically provide us with HOA and CCNRs, HOA docs and all the CCNRs, etc. Um, however, the duty to disclose what's in the CCNRs falls on the seller. One of the things that's, that's scary about this is how late in the transaction people are getting this information. You know, a lot of people are getting this, by the time they get it, the genie's out of the bottle and the bottle's broken. They really, even if they don't like something on it, 
Their life will be disrupted heavily if they walk away from the deal. Make sure you have a system in place to get CCNRs as soon as possible. Their seller disclosure. If you represent a seller, you want the buyer to have those things like during the inspection period at the latest. Why? Because the buyer can literally look at them and go, uh, subsection 3B, I don't like, I'm canceling. Subsection 3B could be the name of the subdivision. They can literally disapprove anything. So it's really in the seller's best interest not to wait for, for title to deliver that package get the, from, the, from the HOA. Here's what I say. Uh, title companies are nice, and if they're not, go to the HOA, get all the HOA, get your full disclosures up front, get it as a package, and then have it available for the buyer when they write the offer, either on the documents tab or at the house or in, you know, in a book. They'll provide that for you. Get it signed off early in the game. It's also only fair to buyers. Um, a buyer gets, see, I've seen, had a buyer get CCNRs uh, and, and HOA stuff restrictions four days before closing. Their house had already closed and they had an electrical contracting company. In the, in the CCNRs and, and rules was a thing you could not park commercially identifiable vehicles in the driveway. Well, unfortunately, they had two trucks and both of those trucks had the electrical pipe rack stuff on them. They were completely wrapped, they were rolling commercial, and they wouldn't fit in the garage. Buyer had no choice but to close and have his pipe racks cut down. Um, and, and I felt really bad because that was kind of on me. Although back then we really depended on title and ever since then I'm like, no, as a buyer's agent, it's my responsibility to make those suckers get in their hand because that sucked for them. Um, and, it, and fortunately it was when the market was going up, nine months later they sold the house and and bought a different one in a non-HOA subdivision horse property because they want to build a barn for their business, you know, whatever. Why do you feel like it was on you? Didn't they receive it? They just didn't receive it? I didn't know. They didn't receive it till almost closing. I did not make oh, sure so they received them. Yeah, I, I, you know, I didn't protect them. And I take, anything goes wrong, I, just, I always tell you, that anything goes wrong with a real estate transaction that affects your buyer, it's your fault. The other party is a complete jerk, screws everything up. If that jerky behavior ever affects your client, that's on you. I, I was taught that. Go through your career going, everything that goes wrong is my fault. You will take it much more seriously. There's something you can never do in this business. That's this. What am I doing? Pointing the finger. I'm pointing the finger. I'm putting blame elsewhere. Now, is the source of the problem their jerk client? Yeah. But if that, that behavior affects my client, I did not do my job of protecting my client. All right. Buyer shall have five days after receipt of commitment, etc. <coughs> subsequent exception to find seller notice of disapproved. Seller shall convey title by warranty deed, subject to existing tax assessments, co covenants, conditions, and restrictions, right of ways, easements, and all other matters of record. Buyer shall be provided seller's expense, an out to homeowner's policy. If not available, standard policy would be available showing vested title buyer, buyer may acquire extended coverage, etc. Um, you want to know the real money in the title business is lender policies. They actually are already insuring the house, the title, and then they insure the lender, insure the lender to get more money for literally packing a second insurance policy over the first one. If there's a claim, which policy is going to pay? The underlying. So it's a thing of beauty. Buy stock and title companies, that's what I'm telling you. Any questions on that? Cool. All right. Additional instructions. Escrow companies shall promptly furnish notice of pending sale that contains the name, address, the buyer to the homeowners association, in which the premise is located if escrow company is also acting as title agency. But it's not the title insurance, title insurance policy escrow shall deliver buyer upon deposit funds. A closing protection letter from the title insurer. Title companies, title agencies, two different things. There aren't that many actual title companies. Uh, Fidelity is a title company. Chicago is a title company. First American are a title company. Lawyers is a title agency under Fidelity. Grand Canyon is a title agency under Fidelity. So they are sell, although they don't have the Fidelity name, the product they sell is Fidelity National Title Insurance. Okay, other companies subcontract for First Americans, other countries subcontract for, uh, for Chicago, and I believe WGF does their own title as well. Um, that's not really an issue. 
Uh, I've never seen it be a problem, but you, you know, need to make sure they understand that they may be getting a different name on their title policy than where they went. Okay. Uh, all documents necessary to close transaction be executed promptly by buyer and seller in the standard form used by escrow company. Escrow company shall modify such documents to the extent necessary to be consistent with the contract. Understand, nothing the title company can ever do can come from anywhere anywhere but the contract. I'm going to go back to what the title company really is. Escrow company fees unless stated herein shall be allocated equally to buyer and seller, 50-50 split. Escrow companies shall send parties and brokers copies of all notes communications directly to seller, buyer, or brokers. That's very important. A title company must copy you on everything that's not confidential. Then they must forward it to you in real time. They cannot sit on documents or information. Okay? And I've had them say, well, I wasn't going to send it to you until I got authorization from the other agent. Like, the contract doesn't say you'll provide copies upon authorization from the other agent. The contract says you'll provide copies. All right. Now, here's the deal. There's a, there's a misconception about title companies. People think title companies work for both parties. They don't. Title companies work for nobody. They are truly to be a neutral third party. Is there some incestuous relationships between companies and title companies and escrow officers and agents where they're making decisions based on relationship? Yeah, that's a very bad thing. But in pure terms, and I had this conversation a few minutes ago, this is their boss. They're not allowed to interpret it, okay? They cannot interpret the contract. All they can do is enforce it in black and white, literal terms, okay? So you say, well, you're not listening to me. If they are, their answer should be, I'm never gonna listen to you. I'm listening to the purchase contract. Their literal job is to enforce the terms of the contract, implement, and eventually, hopefully, get down that magic day called the close of escrow. Tax prorations, taxes are prorated as the close of escrow. Simple as that. Release of earnest money. In the event of a dispute between buyer and seller regarding earnest money deposited with escrow company, buyer and sellers authorize escrow company to release the earnest money pursuant to the terms and conditions of this contract and sole and absolute discussion. Buyer and seller agree to hold harmless and indemnify title company against any claim, action, or lawsuit, judgment of loss, etc., and <coughs> including cost of attorney fees relating to in any way to release of earnest money. What does that say? When it comes to earnest money, title company's God. I mean, they have absolute power, which means it's really important that you only deal with title companies. They're going to do the right thing. And by the way, them doing the right thing will result in your client losing money as much as it does someone else's. Because I don't want a title company that's going to err on my behalf or my client's behalf. I want a title company that's going to letter up the law, and if my client loses earnest money, they should. Now, do I have title companies make bad decisions on earnest money and cancellation? Absolutely. And I question them on it, and sometimes I win because sometimes they're relying on the wrong part of the contract. I'm in the middle of one of those right now. Um, but when it comes right down to it, their word is final. So no one governs them? They, they don't have, is that coming soon? Do what? No one governs them? Like there's no like party that's above them that can be like, hey, dispute. You guys there's a regulatory them. agency, but you'd have to go to them and, and prove intent that it was their intent to not follow the contract. And here's one of the problems with title companies having that discretion. There's one of the problem with guys like me. Um, I can read exactly the same part of the contract, oh. and if you're my buyer, mm -hmm. I can make one hell of an argument to get your money back. If I represent the seller, I can make one, one hell of an argument as to why you shouldn't get your money back. There's a lot of our contract that, that you can find interpretations in there. That's why title companies scare me when they start interpreting, because they should just literally read, did not close, got a loan denial, buyer gets money. Okay? That was black and white. There's some grayer ones in there. Uh, when you get into conditions, contingencies, cure notices, breach, we're in the middle one right now, they issued a cure for something that can't be cured. The title company said they're right. I said, no, they're not. They're not. And I made a case that they're not. And they, they'll take it upstairs and they're, they're going to find out I'm, I'm right. What's the but they have 
absolute sole discretion, which means what title company you use matters. What's the issue? What? Are you allowed to say? Oh, yeah. It was uh, uh, the buyer changed lenders, and they cu they cured them based on failure to get written consent to change lenders. I was talking about Section 2K. Section 2K simply says they have to notify. Well, they sent over an LSU. That's obviously notice. Yeah. And an LSU had an additional term in it, which means if they don't close, they'll lose earnest money. But they can't cure for failure to get written consent when the contract says you don't need written consent. So they were they are, you know, they didn't like something on the LSU. Our contract's very buyer weighted. If they if that buyer doesn't close, they'll definitely get the earnest money, but they can't cancel until they've actually been in a potential breach. Changing terms of lender and adding additional conditions to the lender is not potential breach. It's a change allowed under Section 2K as long as you close, doesn't cost an extension or cost the seller more money. And uh, some associate broker, right, right to our agent, your broker's dead wrong. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. There's one section of the contract I know how it works. That's section 2K. Because <laughs> I'm a demon for getting earnest money with that baby. All right, prorations and assessments. All assessments and fees that are not a lien as of close of escrow, including homeowner association, rents, et cetera, if assumed insurance payment, interest rates, interest on coverage services, shall be prorated as of close of escrow. The only exception to that might be uh, you're doing a land deal or a deal in the boonies where they recently paved the road. Some of those assessments are huge. They're paid in your water bill maybe for 20 years. Uh, that may be a deficit on value and the buyer would have a justification to say, I'll give you this price for the house, I'll close it, but I want you to pay off that assessment rather than me have to pay 40 bucks a month for the rest of my damn life. Assessment lien, the amount of any assessment lien or bond, including those charged by special taxing districts such, such as community facilities district, shall be prorated as of close of escrow. Everything prorated as of close of escrow. Like I said, the only exception I can think of is, is a payoff on a, on a big assessment. Um, and obviously, homeowner's assessments are a different animal. You would see that in title, right? Because there's a cloud on it? What, pardon me? You would see that in title because there's a cloud on it? Yeah. There's... Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a, a big cloud. There are certain types of assessments uh, which it's hard to get title insurance if they're not paid off as well. Because if they're not well written or not properly recorded, the title company is not going to insure. Uh, hello, Buckeye, 30 years ago. All right. Oh, let's see. Now let's talk about my favorite subject. Section 4, Disclosure. Section 4A, Seller's Property Disclosure Statement. Seller shall deliver a completed AR residential seller property disclosure statement. Form to buyer within three days of acceptance. Buyer shall provide notice of any items disapproved within five days of receipt. Okay, within the inspection period or five days of receipt, whichever is later. Which is why you want to get spuds delivered in three days so this sucker is removed. Uh, if a seller does not deliver you a spuds in three days, issue a cure notice on day four. You have a fiduciary duty to cure any material breach. And failure to deliver spuds is certainly a material breach. Now, there is a complete insanity out there that I, I'm on the soapbox, and you, people are like, God, he's going to say it again. If you don't get a spuds on every listing you have, I'm going to ask you why you hate your seller. There is virtually no situation where a seller benefits from not delivering a seller property disclosure statement. Seller property disclosure statement is a seller protection document. Seller's duty to disclose is, notice it doesn't, this talks about delivery of a form. Does it say anywhere, anywhere on here does it reference seller's duty to disclose? No. Section 4A only talks about the document. Where is duty to disclose referenced in the contract? Next class, Section 5B. Okay, seller will disclose anything material. So if they waive spuds, in no way are they releasing the seller from the disclosure obligation. Also, if they ask the buyer to waive spuds and they don't disclose in court, the court tends to look at that historically as not, 
I didn't give him a spuds because I don't know. He said, I didn't give him a spuds because I didn't want to say. I've had people say, Mom, you have to wait a seller property disclosure statement. I've waived it. I've said, good, I want full disclosure of everything your seller knows about that house, including all receipts for the flip. They go, you waive that. What did I waive? A form, which gave them the opportunity to tell them the information. Even if you have someone waive spuds, you are legally obligated to disclose everything on it, unless you get a, a, something signed that says, buyer waives all disclosure obligations by the seller. Buyers are aware seller may know numerous material defects that would affect the compensation they pay for the property and they don't care. Who in the hell would sign that? That's what sellers think buyers are doing when they sign because agents are stupid and won't tell them what that's what that really means. Seller property disclosure statement is intended to protect the seller. Get one in every deal. And people say, well, I've never occupied the property. So then we should be okay with waving spuds all the time because they're always asking to wave spuds. But, but, it, but it's, it's not, it's in no one's, I, like I said, I'll call them, why do you hate your seller? I mean, and, and, and Jermaine, I don't know where Jermaine lives. But if I had his address, I could hop on the computer and do a seller property disclosure statement and probably answer 15 to 20 questions based on that research. People saying that they don't, they never lived there, it's completely irrelevant. I've never lived in his house, I don't even know where it's at. But I can do that. <coughs> the beauty of the spuds, <coughs> as you have yes or no, you can leave it blank. Leaving it blank says, I don't know, you figure it out in your discovery. Not answering it says, I know, but I ain't telling. And uh, we have people, I'm an investor, I don't do disclosures. I'm like, what about your legal requirement? They said, well, I guess sellers believe having spuds waived releases them from their legal requirement. It doesn't. It doesn't even release them from their contractual requirement because that's in Section 5B. Stop it. I've never occupied the property. I'm a flipper. You know, bankruptcy is not going to do a spuds for you. Probate is not going to do a spuds for you. A bank is not going to do a spuds for you. Zillow is not going to do a spuds for you. Offer pad is not going to do a spuds. Open door is not going to do a spuds. Um, everyone else, if you put a property on the market and ask spuds to be waived, you're shooting your seller in the foot. It is one of the most inexcusable acts and it's probably done on 25% of transactions. And I have people say, well, well, you know, they don't know anything about the property. If to say a flipper doesn't know about the properties, it's insane. I flip properties. I knew where every, I knew what every screw cost. You know, I guarantee you, what the properties that I have remodeled and flipped, I knew more about them than the builder did. You know, twenty years ago, it's ludicrous, and it has to stop because agents are going to start. There's going to be you know, there's emails out there. There's already a couple of cases. The email advised the seller not to do a spuds because they never occupied the property. Well, when the suit hit, guess what? Seller was acting on agent's advice. Who should lose in that lawsuit? That agent's E and O should write a check because that's 100% on the agent. Never advise a seller to not do a spuds. Never advise a seller that it's okay to not do a spuds. Tell a seller you're an idiot if you don't do a spuds. It's intended to protect you. And then obviously it's a great source of information for the buyer because it's crap they don't have to go figure out for themselves. But people say, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know any of the information. Really? You don't know how long you've owned the property or where you pay the electric bill. It's complete baloney. Would you recommend that um, you put that all in an email and if they refuse to do a spud still, I mean, it's on them instead of you? Oh, if they refuse to do a spud, I might find. And then on day one, I issue a cure under Section 5B for failure to disclose everything material about the, about the property. And people say you can't do that. They waive spuds. You, you can't waiving spuds. Does that in any way affect Section 5 of the contract? No. If you're, if you're um, representing the seller, though, you're going to cure not, a cure notice for them? No. If, oh, no. If I represent a seller, I will not put a house on the market without spuds. Never okay. have, never will. Okay. Because I would want except a dead, except, I, I take it back. Except the dead guy. Okay. Because obviously his kids and ended up with a house in probate. We're not in a position to really do that. One of them has lived there 45 years earlier. I mean, it was an old guy died. Uh, but that's what, other than that, mm, no. So you wouldn't put it on even though, I mean, if they don't send it, they're shooting their cell phone. I mean, I still want the money. Like, what do you mean you wouldn't put it up? You wouldn't list the house? No, listen, I, 
if, if a if, if, if a seller does, it. there's not a seller out there I can't convince to do a spuds because I'm because I, I do my job right. I'll, I my job is to protect the seller. One of the people I'm supposed to protect them from is who? Themselves. Themselves. That's so funny because Judy Lowe, she, you know, was a whole speech to commissioner, but she said basically my job is to protect the public from you. Your job's harder because your job is to protect them from themselves. Um, bad decision making because if they make bad decisions, who pays for it? We do. Not putting up spuds on a property is bad decision making. And it's not sellers that are doing it. It's agents that are advising them not to. If you do that, you should pay every penny of loss because that person gets sued. That's on you. Do your damn job. In a lot of cases, because agents don't want to mess with it. I know agents, I've had an agent say, I won't do spuds or, I love this, we'll talk about Clue. I don't do spuds on any properties. Never have, never will. I said, why? They go, because it's a pain in the ass. I'm like, why do you hate your seller? This agent is one of those people that literally thinks anything that makes his job easier is what he should be doing because he needs to be out doing more marketing and, and, and raising his income. Representing his client is an unpleasant thing he has to do that he doesn't like and he sure as hell not going to do a good job of it because what's it matter? Nobody gets sued, everything closes. That's his attitude. For the record, he does not work here. And he will never work here. He's a friend of mine. He's just an idiot. He's just an idiot. He's like, he thinks he's above that. All right, have I made my point, people out there in internet world? <laughs> and I know there's agents with this company that probably three quarters of listings come without a seller property disclosure statement. I'm talking to you. You are wrong, period, and you're violating your fiduciary to your client. Get them. Sometimes they don't know diddly. What do you do? You give them a spuds and has seven things answered and the rest blank. Says, you know what? I'm ignorant. You figure it out. Not delivering a spud says I'm withholding information. You don't believe me, read the case law. All right, I'll get off my soapbox. Moving along. Section 4B. Now, I want everyone to read Section 4B with me. Seller shall deliver buyer a written five year insurance claims history regarding the premises for insurance claim. What time, time they've owned the premises on these five years, sellers, insurance company, or insurance organization for him not available to sell with the fund. So the buyer shall provide notice of any items just proof five days after receipt of claims history. I, I'm going to paraphrase that. Um, what that what does that not say? There is no reference to clue in there. If you're using, I love to say this because this is just silly. If you're using the word clue in 2018, you're freaking clueless. We took it out of the contract six years ago. I know agents been in business a year that use the word clue. I'm like, where the hell did you get that word? We still have it on one of our checklists. The term is insurance claims history. Clue stands for Comprehensive Loss Underwriting Exchange. It's a clearinghouse for insurance claims. It's Carfax for a freaking house. Everybody knows what Carfax is. Everything was ever done in that car. Is, that's all it is. Um, Clue is Kleenex. Insurance claim history is tissue. Okay? So if I ask you for a Kleenex and you say you don't have any, and I say there's a box of tissues right there, you can look at me and go, I don't have any Kleenex. Those are Johnson & Johnson tissues. Those aren't Kleenex. Kleenex is a brand. Clue is a brand. It's one form. I've actually had some buyers say, go ahead and wait your clue. Call them next day. I want the insurance claim history. They said you waived it. I said, no, I didn't. I waived one form of it. Conference is a loss underwriting exchange. I waived Kleenex. I did not waive tissue. But again, it's inexcusable to ask someone to waive that. Because, it, and, and you don't want to have it, you want to get it early in the game because a buyer has the right to know if there are any claims because then they can get an underwritten quote and not get a nasty gram from their insurance company six weeks after closing and say, oh yeah, by the way, we've doubled your rate. Happens all the time. Because otherwise they're closing with a binder quote, which is just based on square footage, zip code, type of roof, and, and age. It's from a chart. And once they go to underwriting, they go, well, yeah, maybe those four things got you $900 a year, but you have two air conditionings and a roof, let's take you up to $2,200 a year. Your client's going to be pissed off, and they should be. Don't waive it. Now, are there situations where a seller will not provide one? Again, probate. Family may not have access to it. Banks aren't going to do it. And you have that rare situation with some investors, and my significant other deals with one of these people. Um, they self-insure. They're flippers. They basically don't insure the property because insurance is uber expensive, and it's almost 
in some cases almost impossible to get insurance on a vacant home that's going to be vacant and never occupied. If you move in for a month and move out, you're all right. But if you never move in, they have an issue. That's, they, you know, that's a situation I can't give you what I don't have. But I always say, do you, have, do you have an insurance claim history from when you bought it? Because that would fall under Section 5B, material and must be disclosed, because they can't say they didn't know. The other scary part of that is there comes a point when you don't insure a house that it becomes less insurable, and, or the rate goes up. If you don't pay your car insurance, and it was due on the 1st of June, you're fine. They're going to send you notice of cancellation, and as long as by, by June 30th, you make it even and pay back, they will reinstate you, everything's the same. If you go to July 1st, they will not reinstate you. They will require you, you are an uninsured, uninsured motorist because you're uninsured for more than 30 days, and they may require you to do an SR-22 filing, but I guarantee your freaking rate is going to go through the roof. Same potential problem with the home. But even if they don't have insurance on it, Ask if they got an insurance claim history when they bought it and demand a copy of that. In those cases, have your buyer's insurance agent go to, ready for this? Where am I going to send them? Clue. Have them go pull a clue report. They can do that. Better to come from the seller, though. And this is how they, people say it's, I know it's a pain in the ass. Really? Hi, <coughs> Joe Billy Bob at State Farm. I need an insurance claim history for my house at 44. 444 North 4th Street, and he'll go, give me four minutes. He'll pull up your file, click on claims report, attach that to an email. You can literally have it by the time you get off the phone. It's a no-brainer, but it is a potential cost and falls under Section 5B, must be disclosed because it could material affect what they pay. <coughs> the allergies are gnarly, man. I always say there's four seasons. People say Arizona have four seasons. We have four seasons. We had allergy season. We had bad allergy season. We had really bad allergy season. We got holy crap! I want to die allergy season. <laughs> right now I'm in season number four, and when you add the low humidity to it, it gets a lot worse. So, watch me suffer. All right, section four C. Now they call me the guru, uh, the Godfather. I'm known for my knowledge of the contract. Um, section four C. To foreign sellers, here's what I'm going to tell you. I don't know anything about it. If you have a foreign seller that even potentially might be subject to the Foreign Investment Real Property Tax Act, FERTA, refer them to an international tax attorney or an international tax accountant. Do not have an opinion. Do I know the rules for FERTA? Pretty much. Am I ever going to admit that to a client or give them an opinion? No, we're not supposed to give legal opinions or tax opinions, but I guarantee you, international tax law is not an area that we want to get involved in. Yeah. Do we have a contact like in, in our back page for uh, an attorney? For an, I, I haven't had. No, I don't think so. <laughs> and, and by the way, I don't. I would never refer a client to, to an accountant. Anything tax related, I'm not going to refer them because what if the person I referred them is a sleaze bag? I'm saying, you go find your own, okay? And and I, I'm very I'm very uh, uh what am I looking for? what am I going to say um, hesitant to ever refer anything other than specific vendors ever. I don't refer attorneys. If they want an attorney, I'll give them I'll give the name of the top five real estate attorneys in town. They say which one do you like. I say they're all awesome, and they all have different specialties, and I don't know. I mean, I literally try to stay away from that because never refer someone. Never let someone refer you to a person whose job is to protect you from them. And one of the person attorneys are always protecting our clients from is us. That's a good rule of life. Never let someone refer you to someone whose job is to protect you from them. That's why I don't like specific individual home inspector uh, referrals. Because part of a home inspector's job is to protect that client from me. The stuff I lied about, the stuff I said, they started to see that crack and I did this. You know their agents, it, well, there are people out there who do that. They'll see something wrong with the house, and they'll distract the buyer so the buyer doesn't find it. I know agents that will do that with a home inspector. Wow. Listing agents. They literally go there for the purpose of distracting a home inspector so they might not find as much crap. Now, I consider that horrible and wrong, and here's the problem. Now, you, now that you've heard that, you have to assume every agent's doing that. 
You have to, every word that comes out of someone's mouth, you have to assume is a lie. Everyone you work with, you have to assume they're horrible until they prove otherwise. We don't get to be optimistic about other people in this business. We get to be optimistic about our business, optimistic about our clients, but you need to come from a position of pessimism about other agents because the baseline of knowledge and skills is so low and the baseline of ethics is not what I would like it to be, shall we say. Any questions? So I skip Berta. Um, let paint disclosure. I'm not going to read all this. If the seller has knowledge of lead-based paint or they've ever had a report or study, they need to provide that. A buyer has a right to have the property tested and find out for themselves. The thing with lead-based paint is if it's built between the beginning of time in 1977, they call it before 78, which means it ends on seven, at the end of 77, December 31st, 1977, built before that. Lead-based paint disclosure is required. Buyer needs to have the opportunity uh, to do an inspection. The lead-based paint disclosure form, you find me a broker that doesn't hate that form. And we hate it for a lot of reasons. One, it gets us involved in, ready for this, federal environmental law. I want to deal with Arizona real estate law I don't want to get to anything with the word federal in front of it, and except unless FHA, when you're talking about housing, if a broker is found to have an insufficient or non-existent lead-based paint in a file for a house that's built before 1977 or older, that broker can be fined $11,000. If we are, and then I'm speaking for every broker in town, we're all literally a bunch of Nazis when it comes to lead paint. We will chase you down, you know, there, and there, you, if there's one form, you're never going to get us to say, well, all right, we'll let it go. You know, because sometimes people just don't deliver stuff. And you've got evidence you sent 40 emails begging, sometimes we'll let you slide. If it's lead-based paint, you will not get paid without it. Period. Because we can't. So don't get mad at us. It's also the only form that cannot be signed in counterpart. It's also the form that you guys need to sign. And the number one reason I kick lead-based paint is because the agent signed at the bottom, but one of them doesn't initial. You have to initial, I believe it's line 34, and sign at the bottom as agents. Just get used to it, deal with it. It's a pain in your ass, it's a pain in our ass. The entire industry hates it. And the number of properties actually tested positive for lead-based paint in single-family residential is I've heard of two. And I go back to uh, literally, I started as, I was in the business when lead based paint disclosure was started being required. I've been around the whole time. Two houses I've ever known to test positive. By the way, if you tell Cavalier Home at the end of 32nd Street, up on 85028, some of those houses had lead paint. I thought they all did, but people just paint over it. Lead paint, lead, where, where the problem and why lead paint really is a horrible thing and has, has done major damage to the cerebral processes of juveniles. Lead paint was a one coat, extremely thick paint. It would, and you could put it right on concrete. So when you think of tenements, you think of the projects in Chicago or New York, mm -hmm. and they weren't maintained, but those things were, those had lead paint because you could paint right on the cement walls and they were intended to be basically you know minimal. And of course, that stuff starts chipping, and that's where and kids eat it. That's where it was really an issue. It was a commercial product for residential. It was impractical, um, so it was used, but it wasn't nearly that common. Um, and if it's been painted over, you, it still doesn't mean it's not there. A lead paint test is going to go in and scratch all layers. It's not like popcorn ceiling, where it's encapsulated. It's still potentially a problem because it, uh, uh, you know, it's the it's the uh, scientific, you know, issues with lead. Uh, scary stuff, but uh, uh, it's for us, it's just that uh, you hate it, do it anyway, because we're going to ride you till you get it right. John, doesn't that have to be signed by the sellers and the listing agent prior to the buyers? Yes. Signing? Well, yeah, it's a disclosure form. So you can't get a blank disclosure and then sign it and send it back. How can the buyer say they've received and had the opportunity when there's no touch, nothing to receive. That's why, put them on the damn documents tab. Spuds, lead paint, documents tab. 
But then that you would, have to deliver it to them if they don't take right, it out there. Right, right. And just but make sure that, you know, and like I said, it's one thing in a file. We're going to be we're going to be jerks. We don't have a choice. And don't think it's because we want to. We wish it would go away. The other side of this is, and it's a very common thing, I hate rejecting contracts. If you get something rejected, don't be annoyed, be embarrassed. It means you screwed up. And this is really, this isn't even a huge screw up. If it's built after 1977, 78 or newer, you have to initial line 182. It seems silly, but we will reject the document. And it's probably one of the main reasons I reject documents. Make sure. Also, everybody out in the internet world, every, zip forms is really cool. The zip forms template is awesome. Is it template or template? Template or template? I don't know. <laughs> um, but here it has a glitch. If you're using that, it will, the little initial automatic thing, it will by default put initial boxes on both 181 and 182. You have to go in and manually remove it. If you don't catch it, you're going to get it back with both boxes initialed by your buyer because they can't complete the deal, the contract, doing it, signing until they've initialed all the boxes. And then I'm going to send you it. You're going to be required to do an addendum removing the initials from the wrong box. So everybody just know this it's a glitch. You must manually remove. All right. Get done early today because there's no way I can get into section five. Four E affidavit of disclosure. If the premise are located under, know this list unincorporated area of the county. That means it's not in a city, it's not municipalated there, incorporated, and five or fewer parcels of property other than subdivided property are being transferred. Okay unsubdivided, unincorporated, stuff out in the boonies, it's been broken to five or fewer, seller shall deliver completed affidavit of disclosure form, it's required by law to buyer within five days of acceptance. Buyer shall provide notice of anything they disapprove and give a, sign a receipt for it within five days, whichever is later. Um, fortunately, title companies take care of this, Unfortunately, you know when affidavits of disclosure typically show their little heads? Way after five days. Uh, the good news is, there's really, we're running out of unincorporated, unsubdivided land anywhere in Maricopa County. It's not that common of a deal, but it will be required. <coughs> the good news is, you won't know if it's required. You may, because it may say, if, if you list a property that requires an affidavit of disclosure, what do you do with it? You get your affidavit disclosure and you put it on the documents tab. Okay, and then you have to do a send acknowledgement that they received it. Um, but if you wait for title, uh, they may, can you imagine buyers, if buyer gets cold feet, that affidavit disclosure shows up 20 days down the road, 10 days before closing, buyer can absolutely walk because of it. And if you represent the seller, you wanna make sure you're closing all the back doors. Delivering spuds is a back door. Affidavit disclosure to back door, and our contract has well, our contract has more back doors than a Houston whorehouse on a Friday night. I mean, it's, it has enough ways out. We need to make it a little more restrictive on the buyer as soon as we can. All right. Um, I was just talking to Larry, the DB, about this a while ago. Um, write the word "kill clause" underneath 4F. Sometimes. You have a buyer, a cash buyer, who's through their inspection period. They've received title report. You have a finance buyer who's fully qualified, but they want out of the transaction. They need to walk. This, and I call them kill clauses. This is a clause you can use to get people out. It's crappy. Uh, I did a deal with, uh, uh, one of our agents did a deal with with Russell Shaw, uh, they referred they referred to it. We did this to them. They referred to it as Bush League. They knew exactly where it came from. They knew it came from me because I know y'all. I'm not bragging. I'm applying for a job. John Dyer plays Bush League with contracts. Um, but uh, it works. 
And here we're going to talk about seller shall immediately notify buyer of any changes in the premises or disclosures made herein, the spuds or otherwise. Shut, such notice shall be construed and update the spuds unless seller is already obligated by this contract or amendments here to, the cor to correct the repair, etc. Which means if you have a deal on the Benzer and the sellers agreed to fix it, you cannot require them to update the spuds because they don't have, have to update. They don't have. It's been disclosed. It's been discovered. It's been the problem has been solved. Buyer shall have five days after delivery of such notice to disapprove, even if it's fixed. So, you get down, you have your inspection period, they call and say, hey, the floor got a big gap, the wood floor got a big gouge in it when they're moving furniture, we're going to fix. Send me an updated spudge. Disclose the damage. Buyer has five days to walk. You find out anything material, something outside of CCNR, or something about the neighborhood that they should have disclosed on the spuds, which, by the way, what do they have to disclose? Anything that's material, quiet enjoyment, I mean, uh, cost money, quiet enjoyment, uh, uh, physical, I mean, anything, they have, anything that falls in that category requiring them to update the spuds, it's an absolute backdoor. And I got, I think I got seven buyers out of contract with it last year. In every case, the agent for the seller hated us, which they should. I call it a kill clause. You know what it really is? It's a weasel clause. It's literally a way that a buyer can weasel out of a contract. Hey, you know what? What's your job some days? So weasel they're... finder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what? So, but they're, they're saying that they didn't know about it, right? During the spuds? I, listen, I've had a buyer find out something from a neighbor Okay, about damage to a common wall that was not disclosed by the seller, but the seller knew about it. But they said Re that they didn't know, right? It doesn't matter. They didn't disclose if, it. If you don't know about it, yeah. but I do my due diligence on your house and I tell you about it, now you know about it, I can require you to update the spuds with information you found out from me. If it's not something that's already been agreed to be repaired on the venture. Like I said, it's a we it's weaselly. But if buyer needs out, and everybody, everybody on the internet, if you have a buyer that's got cold feet, call me. Um, probably 40% of the time, I can find a weasel clause to get them out. And I used to work at the old Dan Schwartz before they sold to HomeSmart, and, and I literally had the horrible nickname, the deal assassin. Because people would come in and this, they'd say, this contract's ironclad, and, and I would call that a challenge. And I'd go through the contract, we're out of here. It's amazing. So if they don't update the spuds, you can say you, you cure them, cure them, and then three days later cancel. Now, and you just provide that to title and say this yeah. is the reason why. Yeah. And if they do update the spuds, then you can disapprove and cancel. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, it's an absolute oh. lose. <laughs> it's a lose lose for the seller. Yeah. I mean, this really is. It's almost unfair to a seller, but disclosure, disclosure, and approval is approval. Now, sometimes it's things that buyer really needs to get out of the deal, like they find out that. You know, there was a undisclosed fifteen thousand dollar paint and roof requirement by the HOA. Then that's 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 very common. That's when a buyer that's when a buyer is going to literally bail. That's not a weasel clause. That's legit. But if you have a buyer, these way out because uh, and it's I guess it's unfair to sellers. Uh, uh, you guys went to real estate school and heard about this antiquated concept called caveat emptor. Uh, this contract is based on the concept of caveat venditor bendovor. Not let the buyer beware, but the seller get bent. It's very unfair to sellers. This is a gnarly one, okay? And it's, I've had people say you can't do that. The water heater broke. The seller replaced a freaking water heater. You're getting a new water heater. So you disclosed it, we're canceling. No question. What if you waive the spud? Waiving spuds has nothing to do with disclosure. But this says. Um, to update the spuds, but if you then you it. then you would then you would issue a cure based on section five B failure to close all things material, which means they would then disclose it and you have five so it doesn't matter. <laughs> that, either way, see everybody focuses on spuds for disclosure. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and and jump to five B. We we're finished with section four. This is next class. Seller warrants the seller has disclosed to buyer and broker all material weight defects and any and for any information. That's right there. Concerning the premise known to the seller, excluding pension value, which may material or adversely affect consideration paid by the buyer. It's in a completely different section from SPUDS. SPUDS does not really have anything to do with disclosure. SPUDS is about a document that gives you an avenue for disclosure. 
That's why I don't understand why everybody's waving and thinks waving. It's, it's literally, I'm going to go back to Section 4A. What, having your seller wave spuds makes you a bad broker, is a breach of bad agent, a breach of their fiduciary, and it's virtually inexcusable. Stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Any questions? Cool. Well, we're we're, we're going to get out here an hour today because Section 5 is and 6 is yeah. is an hour on its own. Plus, I covered a lot of brain-bending material today. Uh, you had to listen to a lot of preaching because my whole spuds thing. Uh, remember, we're here for you. You call the broker hotline. Uh, we're doing good, and uh, agents are doing good. Like I said, if you know, but don't hesitate. I've had I've had two agents in this week say, "Well, I was going to call the broker hotline, but I hate to bother you guys." There are five of us answering. It's a coolest system ever. It rings on all five of our phones simultaneously, which is why you get it's. it's I've never seen a broker response or broker support at this level. But we want you to call because if you don't call. Then you're going to come five days later and ask me a question, and pardon my language, the shit has hit the fan, and now you want me to help clean it up. Call me when you think when you're concerned about something. Let's figure out how to avoid the problem, and if it's going to hit the fan, how to get a strong enough umbrella to stand in front of your client and make sure they're not downwind. Okay, that's what we're here for. Excellent. So you don't think that would be a vague um, thing to kind of disclose, not disclose, but talk to title, say hey. They, we raise spuds, but they updated the disclosures. But it's not saying you can, like, get out from disclosure says. Then I would. Then I wouldn't reference spuds. I would go to Section Five B and say th they found out about this and did not disclose it to us. Okay. Now that it's been disclosed, we're curing and we can cancel it in the four days. Now understand the cancellation is really under Section Five B. Okay, that's 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 the. And by the way, this the whole spuds thing of disclosure. This is not just contractual. Seller's obligation to disclose is two things. One, it's statutory, directly or indirectly referenced in seven different laws, and ready for this, failure to disclose. Where does failure to disclose in the you know, one through 10 of reasons people get sued and lose? Where does non-disclosure fall? In the top 10 reasons the seller gets sued and lose. Guess. First. Number one, <laughs> Guess where number two is? You understand? It is like 70% of them have to do with failure to disclose the material, late material defects. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's I don't know where it came from. Uh, we had spuds for probably seven years before I ever saw people start waving it. And I started waving it for really stupid reasons. And then I figured out it has nothing to do with sellers. These are lazy ass agents who won't get it from their seller and who cannot pot, and can't, or can't articulate to their seller. Their disclosure obligation under Section 5B in Arizona state law. I'll finish where I started. Thank you very much. We'll see you in two weeks. We'll probably do Section 5 and 6. We may do 5, 6, and 7. Have a great day. Thank you. So you can't put, like, um, fire breeze to um, say, if, say if we do update the spud.